You know, I mentioned at the beginning that, that um, I really think that where we are is, you know, really one of the centers of, of horticulture. I mentioned NC State. Well, one of the, uh, one of the, the parts of NC State that really is, uh, uh, makes us so strong is the extension program. And that's, uh, a lot of states are moving away from extension. Uh, but North Carolina is really invested in it and growing it and constantly trying to improve it. And one of the uh, one of the key tenets of of extension is uh, you know training the trainers, uh, teaching people how to teach other people um, these things. And one of the, their main programs with that in horticulture is the Master Gardener program. And our next speaker, uh, Rich Voynich, is did I get that right? With, with, some, with a Weathington name, I'm always Weatherington or Worthington, so I worry about getting it right. Um, Rich has been a, a, a master gardener for the past half decade, but he's been, um, you know, gardening with his father since he was five years old. He's um, he really fills a niche in this that that we can't address quite as well. We really work on the the landscape horticulture side, and uh, uh, Rich is going to talk to you about. Uh, gardening with for things that you actually eat uh, is down here in the south. <laughs> so he's worked with community gardens all over, uh, really uh, is very, very knowledgeable. Um, some of you should get to know, but also get to know extension. Um, whichever county you're in, you'll have an extension agent, you'll have a master gardener group. Um, those are both great resources for getting information when you have a question. You're always welcome to call us. We love helping people out. But there's all the extensions have a helpline there, and and uh, the they uh, the master gardeners uh, have a helpline, and all they're always willing to help. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Rich to talk about uh, winning strategies for Southern Vegetable Garden. Great, thank you all very much. Uh, I appreciate you inviting me here to speak today, and it's really an honor to to talk aside uh, Doug and Mark. It's, uh, they're great names in the industry, and. I'm honored to be here. So today we're going to definitely talk about vegetable gardening. Um, uh, as Mark talked about, that's kind of my my passion, the thing that I like to do. Um, first, a little bit about Master Gardeners. Again, we already talked a little bit about, but we're part of the Extension Service. Um, we are volunteers, and we provide unbiased research information out to homeowners, um, groups, uh, and cover really everything associated with horticulture. Uh, lawns, gardens, landscapes, vegetable gardens, anything that you have associated with that, diseases and insects. Um, we do have a certification program, so you get this really cool badge, uh, you have to go through the certification program. Um, and actually, we are starting applications now, we're taking them through mid-April, April 15th, I think is when we're accepting them up to for the 2020 class. Um, that class, I can tell you more information about it, but basically it's a, during the week training class where we go through from basic horticulture 101 all the way through everything that you would need to uh, address as a master gardener. Um, it's wonderful being here in Wake County because we have access to a lot of NC State professors and experts um, and industry leaders who are based here that come and teach our classes. So you get world renowned uh, speakers and uh, people that are doing research in the areas that we're covering. So it's a wonderful way to learn about horticulture if you've been ever wanted to get more involved in it. Um, that's It's a great place and becoming a master gardener is a great, great way of doing it. Um, we are really also about education so we do things and presentations just like this. So we take our knowledge and our experience and we try to get that and what we have from the university out into the field. A little bit about me. Um, I've been a resident here since 1991. Um, more importantly, I've been an Arboretum member since 1996. That's almost 25 years of plant giveaways. Um, if you're not familiar with that, if you're new, absolutely become an Arboretum member. It is one of the key reasons to be here. It's a wonderful experience. My landscape at home is basically a culmination of 25 years of plant giveaways. I have been community gardening since 2012. Uh, I've been a master gardener since 2014, but I have been playing in the dirt, as alluded to, for a long time. Uh, and I still love, it's what I do on the weekends and the nights when I'm not doing technology stuff during the daytime.
So we're going to talk about vegetable gardening. And one person that I um, explained, it's a leisure time activity involving lots of time and little leisure. Um, and, and this is not to dissuade you all from, particularly new folks, from vegetable gardening. But vegetable gardening here in the South is a challenge. Um, we have some very interesting weather and things that we have to deal with with vegetable gardening. Um, but I will say that I have a passion towards it, and it's very fun. Um, even when you can survive through the cool and cold of the wintertime and ice storms, through hurricanes, through tornadoes, through droughts and flooding, um, it, it, there's a lot of things that I really enjoy. So we'll start out, we'll cover a lot of different topics, including you want to do what? Starting a vegetable garden. Why can't I grow tomatoes indoors in December? We'll try to answer that question about what to grow and when to grow it here in Central North Carolina. Um, and I will focus on Central North Carolina because what we do on the coastal plain um, and in the Sand Hills areas and what we do differently are in the mountains are very different uh, from what we would do here potentially in the Central North Carolina. We'll cover some growing basics, including sun, soil, and water. Um, we'll talk about things like diseases, like what is the black stuff on the bottom of my tomatoes, and the good, bad, and ugly. And finally, yay, I grew a $10 pepper. <laughs> what do I do with it? Um, I will say there will be some quizzes during this session, and there are some door prizes for those who answer those quizzes correctly. You'll come up afterwards and pick your door prize if you'd like. So why do we vegetable gardening? People have lots of different reasons why they garden um, and grow vegetables. For some, it's to reduce your food budget. Um, gardening is a good way, particularly if you're picking vegetables that are more expensive in the store, um, to help uh, cha or challenge your food budget. Um, a lot of times people are growing it because we want to know what we are putting on our food, how we're growing it, either growing organically or mostly organically. Um, some people do it for exercise. I'm not a big gym person, as you can tell, I, but I'd love to go outdoors and be in the garden. So it's a way I get out, it's relaxing, it's therapeutic for, for me. Uh, as master gardeners, we actually have a group of master gardeners that focus on therapeutic horticulture. So if that's your thing, we have great ways of actually trying to get that type of things out to the uh, community. A lot of times we do it for family. Um, I had my daughters when they were younger working uh, in my garden as, as uh, people in the garden. They complained about it all the time, but now as they're young adults, they love gardening. They're calling me about, hey dad, what can I grow in this pot? What can I grow in my container? How do I keep my basil alive? Um, so a lot of times, many of us, and particularly gardeners that, that work in things like community gardens or school gardens, we do it because we like to work with other people. So we're interacting with other people. We're teaching the things that we learn about gardening. We're learning ourselves from them. Um, and I also love the idea of teaching the next generation. Uh, I've had some great experiences in a lot of the community gardens where I have young kids who learn, and even adults who have no idea what a tomato plant looks like, growing tomatoes, growing them on their own, harvesting, understanding how nature and how we grow things in our, in our area. So what kind of gardens work for you? Um, some of the successful things that you need to have in a garden are sunlight. Um, now, this time of year, we don't have all that much sunlight, so we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that do better in the wintertime versus some of the things that do better in the summer. But in general, for most of our summertime crops, the things that we think about, like tomatoes and peppers, they require at least six hours of direct sunlight. If you're in a really shady area, you're going to have a much, more tr much more trouble growing those types of plants. Um, decent soil quality, and we'll talk about soil testing. Uh, you definitely need to be close to water. One of the big uh, failures I've seen in a lot of gardens that don't succeed, whether it's a community or a school garden or even individual gardens, is ones that are very far away from a water source. So you've got to drag the hose out, or you've got to bring a watering hand to do other things to water those gardens. The uh, last major kind of success of a garden is where is that garden in relationship to what you need? Um, if I have an herb garden that's quarter mile away from my house or you know, a long, long way down the hill, that's going to be more difficult for me to go out and say, hey, go pick some basil or go pick some oregano for what I'm cooking tonight. You want things relatively close and easy to get to, uh, particularly during really cold days where you're trudging through snow. Um, and yes, you can grow a garden in the snow or on those really hot days when you're fighting the insects to get out. 
Uh, as we talked about, there are a bunch of different garden types. Um, so there isn't really one type for one person. Uh, there are typical in-ground beds, uh, which are just beds that are, are raised in the ground but no physical structure. Uh, we've also got things like raised beds here, which are a physical structure, comes in different types and heights. I'll, I'll show you some examples of some that I've dealt with over time. Uh, container gardens, a really great way to start, and we'll talk a little bit about container gardens, things that do well in containers. It's a good way to get your kind of your feet into gardening, vegetable gardening. Um, and finally, edible landscaping. It's a, it's a, it's a big area, um, things that are coming up. We've got some actual experts in this area in the, in the central part of North Carolina who are experts in that type of edible landscaping and dealing more with your, um, breaking the traditional model of what landscaping is in, a, in an urban uh, environment. Start out small. Um, this is not probably what you want to start with. Um, this is an example of my garden actually taken just a couple of weeks ago. Um, as you can see, it's kind of winter, winterized. Um, I've got about 16 beds that are in there, uh, about a quarter, eighth of an acre. Uh, some, uh, a rental space for some beehives that a friend has got some bees out there. I have a lot of my beds that are asleep, but a lot of beds that are under row covers, and I do that for protection just in case we get cold weather at night. Um, everything that I'm growing right now are winter type crops and vegetables, and we'll talk through some of that. Um, I do have some other things like cold frames, um, and you see I have some vertical in the garden. Um, in my case, I will talk a little bit about some deer resistance and other things. Um, I do have a big electric fence. I live further down by Lake Wheeler where I have a family of deer that actually live on my, um, on my property. Um, they actually, I found out the other day, they figured out how to actually step between the two metal wires. <laughs> and, and back in the corner over here is a strawberry bed that they've leveled and raised like a lawn mower. Um, I've never seen, I saw the deer actually step through the wire. I couldn't believe it. Um, so, so I'm not sure exactly what I'm doing next. Um, yeah, razor wire or something in there. To, to, uh, something, something to make it more difficult. Um, and we'll talk, talk a little bit about deer. So, um, gardening in containers. Uh, lots of different ways of gardening in containers. This is just a few examples of the one on the very right. Pretty simple. Large pot. Got tomatoes and peppers growing, and a small pot with herbs growing. Super easy to do. Super easy to start. Um, we'll talk. I'll talk a little bit about what things do well now and what things will do well later. Um, but it's a good way to kind of get going and get started and kind of get your feet into the, the gardening. Uh, raised bed type gardening, and these are boxes. These are actually at the food bank made by a Girl Scout um, for part of one of her projects made out of recycled pallets. So they cut up some big pallets and made, uh, raised, raised beds for that in, the, in, in that area. And this last one on the left-hand side is an actual tree. This is a, a persimmons tree that we've got. Um, in a large uh, wooden crate for the food bank. Uh, reason being is that in the food bank's community garden, they built the community garden over what was a parking lot, and they never removed the gravel underneath the parking lot. So you go down three or four inches, and it's like concrete down there. So instead of going down, we decided to go up. And you'll see a lot of pictures that I might have of the food bank here. We have built things up in the food bank community garden. Uh, but it doesn't, it, you don't have to be just have small plants, is my point. There's lots of ways you can do um, container type gardening with various sizes of containers. Types of containers, um, all sorts of varieties of containers. Um, I think these um, boots down here are the really coolest ones. So you can be super creative in whatever you need for containers. Um, they do need to have some types of drainage. So you need to think about things like that. But I've even seen in some very low cost areas, large bags um, with holes on the bottom that just planting plants right in those large bags. Um, I've seen this in some organizations that deal with gardening in third world countries where um, you don't have either a lot of materials or a lot of space and a lot of soil. Um, this is one way that uh, gardening is done and particularly in very urban areas where you've got people that have moved from the country out into the city um, on rooftop gardens, things like this. Uh, things you do have to watch for containers are whether they're porous or non-porous. Um, porous ones uh, will tend to uh, either dry out quicker or absorb some of the um, fertilizers and chemicals more. 
Um, Non-porous ones uh, will may, may deteriorate faster or depending on whether they're made out of plastic. Uh, there's lots of different options and choices that are available. When you look at containers, one rule or design rule is the rule of three, such that you start with a tall central airy, airy plant in the middle, focused with then medium-sized plants around it, and then cascading plants over the edge. Just one design philosophy when you're looking at different types of plants for, for containers. So some of the things that do well in containers during a uh, cool season are things like spinach, lettuce, kale, cabbage, and collards. Uh, here's an example on the left-hand side of some of those there. Um, this is the time of year that all of these plants are doing really well. Um, so if you're, uh, my garden's growing all of these things right now, both in containers and not in containers. Uh, you can also grow things like carrots, arugula, Swiss chard, and peas. Um, I tend to stay away from uh, plants that have long root structures, say like carrots, um, unless I have very tall pots or very, very a lot of space to do that. Um, so I would typically stay away from the beets and the carrots that may have a lot of the root vegetables there. But a lot of leafy greens doing really well. Um, if you haven't grown Swiss chard, there's a ton of varieties of Swiss chards that are out there and then all sorts of different colors. Super beautiful and particularly in a container where you've got a m large colorful area. Um, one of the things on containers you do need to watch, and I think Doug was kind of alluding to that earlier, uh, one of the questions that came up, you know, what do I do with containers when it gets really cold out? You may have to do, bring those containers inside or into a warmer area because the container itself, if we get a really, really cold night, could freeze that container. And all the plants on top usually do pretty well if you're freezing the entire pot. Uh, if we get a 20 degree or a 9 degree day like we've had some past some years, uh, you do want to try to bring those or cover those or get those plants uh, in the containers in a, in a warmer space so they don't get completely frozen. Some of the warm season vegetables you can grow in containers include things easily grown are uh, bush beans and cucumbers, uh, peppers, squash, and tomatoes. Uh, gourds, a little bit less in containers. You'll need to have a place for them to trellis up to if you want to do that. But these are two examples, again, of different types of containers for summertime crops. Um, this was a pallet that we made in one of the community gardens, turned sideways and created pockets with soil in there. Um, this one, kids painted, and we ended up calling it a pizza pallet. Uh, because we grew everything associated with pizza in there, different types of herbs, tomatoes. Uh, we grew some peppers in there. That was our pizza palette. Um, this is another way of growing tomatoes in a soilless environment where you, you grow in bales of hay. Uh, you have to do some uh, pre-work on that bales of hay to get that, those bales ready to uh, accept the plants. And then there's additional nutrients that you have to add to that versus it being in a soil. Um, but one of the problems, we'll talk a little about some of the tomato problems. Uh, this is one of the ways to uh, avoid some of those problems that we have growing in tomatoes in our warm soil. Other examples of vertical gardening. Um, uh, first question, uh, particularly maybe the younger folks, but certainly older folks, though, what are these? What is this? Shoe, shoe racks. Yeah, shoe holders. So here's an example of somebody that put a group plants in a shoe holder. Um, this one's uh, leftover gutters that someone put and grew along the side, sealed them up, and has grown gutters. And this, if you've been to the NC State Fair, um, this is over in the garden section where there are pots that are vertically up there um, in a, in a uh, structure that they're growing flowers in there. So really pretty if you haven't been to the NC State Fair. So what kind of things should you grow? Um, first of all, grow things that you like. Um, if you don't like beets, don't grow beets. <laughs> If you don't like radishes, don't grow radishes. Um, but do try to do some different things. There's a lot of varieties of vegetables. And in this particular picture, I've got some bok choy growing here, cilantro. Um, I think that's a Swiss chard, a purple Swiss chard growing. Um, all of these things are wintertime crops. And, uh, but grow things, try some things, try some new and different things. There's a lot of things that you can grow out there outside of your traditional tomatoes, peppers, and beans. Um, Grow what is in season, right? Look, and one of the things we'll talk a little bit about is our common crop chart. That's available here uh, for, for free. Uh, talks about a little bit about growing what to grow when. Um, look at what grows well in our area. And again, a common crop chart is a good way of looking at that. How much space do you have? If you don't have a whole lot of space, focus on those plants that are gonna stay small and compact that are not gonna be very large. 
Um, how much work does it take? I, I'm a, the lazy gardener. I don't like going out and weeding. I don't like doing a lot of work in my garden. I like to plant, harvest, and enjoy that. Um, so those are the things that I try to focus on and not, not plants that take a lot of maintenance and a lot of work. Um, also, you can look, as we talked about, kind of which plants are more expensive to buy if you're looking at it from an economic perspective. This is one of my favorite plants called the fish pepper. Um, totally amazing plant. First of all, the plant itself has got variegated leaves, which in itself is just a beautiful plant structure. The pepper itself is about the size of jalapeno, same kind of uh, heat temperature, mild, mild temperature wise. Um, starts out whitish, turns white and green striped, white and orange striped, orange and yellow, fully orange and red, and then fully red. Absolutely amazing plant, super fantastic plant. Has a great history if you look it up online comes from the Caribbean area, originally used uh, in the white form as a spicy sauce with seafood. Um, so it's a really cool plant. And there's a lot of these neat kind of plants with a lot of interesting history that are out there that I highly recommend taking a look at. So let's talk about growing seasons. If you're from other parts of the country, um, this is something you absolutely need to kind of get an idea of. We really have three uh, major growing seasons. Uh, right now, we're in the cool uh, winter and springtime growing seasons. Come mid-April, uh, we will go get into the warm summer season and go through September, October time frame. Then we start the cool fall winter again. And you will see on the common crop chart, a lot of plants in the cool <coughs> spring and the fall are the same sets of plants, just different, different time frames of growing. Um, we are seeing that, that these seasons are becoming warmer. Uh, things are becoming warmer and we can grow things more. Uh, and that's a plus and a minus. It means we have to adapt and adjust what we grow. So maybe our warm seasons, uh, we, it spreads out, we can grow things longer. Uh, maybe also that we can grow things during the cool season that we weren't able to grow or not successfully grow. We have more success with growing in. So there's a lot of, a lot of pluses and minuses to what's going on. Common crop chart. So if you take a look at this chart, you've got the sample, and again, I highly recommend grabbing one of these. Um, this is for the cool season. One side's cool and one side is warm. Starts out with the vegetable category, goes into varieties that have been tested by NC State that we know that do well in our area. So these have been tested for Central North Carolina and do pretty well. <laughs> the next column talks about the plant family, and that's really important when I talk about plant crop rotation. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Planting windows. So as I talk to you, there's springtime and fall time. And you'll see February 1st, today, you, it's a great day to start things like arugula, uh, radishes, uh, carrots. All of these wintertime crops can be started today. It's a good time frame to do. Now these are approximate time frames and you always have to be cognizant of what is going on in terms of the weather. Are we having a real cool, cold spell? If we were getting, you know, 10 degree days, I probably wouldn't put out little transplants today. But you keep those in mind. Um, another great column here, it describes whether these are best put in with seeds for S or T for transplants. A lot of that also depends on what time and when you're growing. So if I were putting cabbages out, say, in early March, I'd absolutely be putting cabbages out as transplants. Um, if I were putting radishes, those are always put out as seeds. Any of the root crops are typically put out as seeds. Um, we don't like to transplant anything that has a root structure. Another column here gives you an idea of days of maturity. So how long it takes to go from a seed to a full produced plant or from a transplant. And you'll see obviously transplants take a lot less longer because you've got a lot, you've got a couple weeks ahead of time. Um, another really important column is the footprint. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but keep that footprint column in mind because that really tells you how big that plant is going to be and how much space it's going to be. We talk about whether plants need vertical support, whether they can handle some shade, and most of the wintertime crops now can handle shade because the sun is very low on the horizon. We don't really get that much daylight, and so they can handle that kind of shade, um, and they're designed and the plants work well when it's not bright sun. In fact, many of these wintertime plants when you get really hot sun, they don't do well. They go to seed, they bolt, they're not, they're, they don't do very well. Um, finally, the last column is whether we talk a little bit about, I'll talk a little bit about succession planting, the idea of succession planting. So, 
talked a little bit about some of the plants uh, from a container, but from a vegetable garden. These are really easy plants if you want to figure out which ones to start with. Um, beans, cucumbers, eggplants, peppers, squash, maybe. We'll talk about squash and zucchinis. Uh, tomatoes also could be challenging or not. We'll talk some about those. Cool season crops are usually very easy to grow. Um, they are usually pretty hardy. They're very easy to get started to grow, usually a lot of success. Uh, troublesing for some plants is very critical. So when you, you look at how do I uh, let these plants grow, beans that are pole beans, uh, tomatoes, even to some extent peppers may need staking up and trellising. So you need to think about that. These are good for vining type vegetables. Beta, tomatoes, uh, one variety is definitely like that. Squashes and cucumbers, those all are vining type plants. You want to be able to do that. Uh, and it's easier usually to install that structure or trellising before the plant gets very tall and big. This way it's already in places it grows. Some examples of vertical gardening, uh, lots of ways you can do it. Um, lots of different technologies and things that are there from everything from simple hoops to more complex bamboo poles um, and structures. Uh, over on the very far left is a melon that's in a little sling. Uh, I've even seen pantyhose and things like that being used for sling mechanisms to hold melon on trellises. But trellising is a great way, if you don't have a lot of space, to be able to grow up. And trellising also gives your garden some additional dimension. Uh, it gives you a, a, a height dimension and a, and a depth that gives you something that uh, can make your garden more beautiful and more attractive. Space for plants. I alluded to that on the common crop chart. So when we start out with these little tomato seedlings, they're in three or four inch pots, and they're great and they're small, and they're maybe three, three to six inches tall. Um, you get them from the big box store, you get them in a four pack, and they're wonderful. And you put them all right next to each other in the garden, and the next thing you know, they're like this, or they're like this. You really need to keep in mind how big is that plant gonna be when you're planting it. Um, tomatoes that are all crunched together are not gonna do very well. They're gonna be more susceptible to diseases. So you want to realize that tomatoes can get two feet around and can, can, depending on the variety, can get up to six feet or tall or longer, uh, taller. So keep those things in mind when you're planting. When you're planting zucchini plants, again, small little six pack or four pack of zucchinis, um, or if you plant them via seeds, realize that zucchini plant can get 18 or 20 inches in diameter and it's going to take a lot of space up. So things to think about when you're designing your space. Um, tomatoes um, need some vertical support. Uh, most tomatoes are, are typically, we see a lot of them from what's called an indeterminate variety, meaning that they, um, they, they bloom throughout the, the season, and, but they're indeterminate in terms of their height. So they basically are vines. Um, you do not have to trellis. My father-in-law in southwestern Virginia would grow tomatoes by just placing them on the ground and let them run. Um, and that's fine. That's one way of doing it, but it takes, he, he, he lived on a farm, so he had a lot of space he could do things. Um, to, trellising is typically the way we deal with tomatoes. It gives them structure, it gives the plants some strength, particularly when they become heavy laden with fruit. Um, the determinate varieties are usually short. Romas um, are a determinate variety. That's, a, that's the uh, Italian type of tomato that you would use a lot for sauces. Um, indeterminate varieties are better boys, big boys, whoppers, a lot of the bigger varieties that we deal with. Some have mixed traits, like cerebrity is mixed, um, and some tomatoes are specifically grown for things like containers. Uh, one variety I've grown in the past was called Patio Princess. Wonderful variety, only about three feet tall, works great in a, in a container. Uh, worked with one of my daughters who had it on her patio in her dorm. So vertical gardening also, um, don't uh, and Doug alluded to this, is that you don't have to plant specific things in specific areas. Uh, you don't have to have a pollinator garden that's designated to pollinators. You can plant pollinators everywhere. And in most of the gardens, community gardens that I work with, we try to plant flowers and pollinators throughout the garden. One, it makes it beautiful. And who wouldn't love a beautiful uh, set of uh, sunflowers in a community garden like that? Um, two, it attracts pollinators into the garden. And one of the things we want is we want those pollinators to come in to pollinate the vegetables that we're growing to get a better yield on our crops. Uh, talk a little bit about raised beds. I wanted to give you some other examples of different types of raised beds. Um, this one happens to be a feeding trough type of raised bed. There do have to be holes in the bottom of this. Um, this one is a raised bed that's more knee height or um, uh, four foot high, about waist height 
for people that can't necessarily bend over. One of our community gardens, we have some gardeners who had uh, trouble bending over with some back problems, so we built a raised bed. Um, now, there are disadvantages of some of these raised beds because they can get colder um, during the wintertime, hotter during the summertime, drier. Um, so you do have some things that you have to deal with anytime you're dealing with containers and raised beds. What's the minimum soil depth you need to work with? So it depends a lot on what you're growing. Uh, if you're growing carrots in this, you know, you're going to have to have 12 to 24 inches of soil that are there. Um, in this bed, uh, this one I think is about 18 inches tall. Uh, I think it's two, two, two by tens that we've got together. Um, so in that case, we've got probably 12 inches something of soil, but a lot of things that are relatively short. So we would grow things like lettuces, um, uh, uh, bush beans, uh, other smaller things, not really large things, but smaller things that we can grow in there. Radishes probably are okay, um, but again, you have to watch uh, you know, what you're planting in there is to be relatively short. Succession planting. This concept is the idea of planting the same crop in successive periods. So for example, planting radishes this week in the garden, waiting two weeks, planting another set of radishes in two weeks, and another set of radishes in two weeks. That way you have um, a, a continual yield over time, um, and it's also great for fast growing crops. So things like um, uh, radishes, even beans, lettuces, um, Swiss chards, those things uh, are, do really well in the succession planting idea um, where you can spread that harvest out so you don't get an entire crop of radishes with you know 500 radishes, what are you going to do with 500 radishes? Um, creating a planting map. So some of the first steps that we do when we look at gardens is decide what is, what is our layout going to be? You know, how much space do we have? Uh, do we have one bed? Do we have two beds? I do cool season and warm season. Uh, we use this as our planting guide and also helps us deal with crop rotation. The crop rotation is the idea of I don't want to plant the same variety of plants or the same family of plants in the same area consistently. Reasons we do that are one, those same varieties, so a pepper, an eggplant, a tomato, same family of plants, will pull the same nutrients, basically the same nutrients out of the soil whether you plant either one of those there. So by doing rotation, I give the soil a chance to um, rejuvenate itself and not to pull the same nutrients out of it year after year after year after year. The other reason we do crop rotation is because insects and diseases also follow that same family of plants. So you'll see the same diseases on peppers and tomatoes. If I can move that around in my garden, I potentially create and break some of that disease chain and so the disease doesn't follow, stay in the same location all the time. Same thing with insects. Insects know a particular plant, plant variety, they typically attack the same plant. If I move that around, I break that process and the insects um, that are out there. Crop rotation, these are just two examples. This is one on the left-hand side of a four-plot garden where I rotate from year to year. Um, on the, on the right-hand side, I have a warm season, cool season. And it shows that, for example, on the left-hand side of this bed, I have tomatoes and basil. The first year, the second year, I'm going to move them over to where the squashes are, the third year where the bush beans are, the fourth year where the peppers and marigolds are. That gives me, even with a small single bed, it gives me the ability of rotating things so that, again, I'm not having the same family of plants in the same area, even though it's a single bed. It does give me some. Now, it's certainly more difficult Commercially, tomato rotations now, um, they say don't grow tomato crops in the same spots every seven years. That's difficult for me in my home garden. I don't have that much space. So, but as much as you can, three and four years, the more you can do, the better and the more reliable your plants are going to be. Um, let's go back. So this could be really any. Um, most of the time when I make beds, when I make raised beds, and particularly things like community gardens, I try to stay in the dimensions of um, what does lumber come in at, at the store, right? So I get them in four foot, eight foot, 12 foot, 10 foot lengths. Those are the type of things that I try to do. Um, in this case, this actual model, um, and I'll talk a little bit about Ready, Garden, Grow is a, is a kind of a follow-on class that we have in partnership with the library. 
Um, this actually is, uh, breaks it up into various square foot. So in this case, um, these are one foot squares. So it's got one, two, three, four foot. It's four foot by eight foot, I think. Um, these tomatoes have basically a 24 inch uh, footprint when they finally grow is a typical size that we do. So in this area, so this is um, basically three foot. I can plant two tomato, potentially two tomato plants um, in that space, maybe one, maybe four, uh, or sorry, four or two in the terms of the dimensions. Uh, but, but that's why it's really also important to understand that footprint, right? So how much space, if I have a four by eight foot bed, um, I'm not gonna fit very many tomato plants in there. And so maybe I only want to grow a few tomato plants if I want to have other things like beans, which are getting more, beans have a little bit more, a smaller footprint, so I can grow a lot more beans and get a little bit more. Um, peppers will also be about the same size as tomatoes. Squashes uh, can take even more space. They can also take a 24 inch space. So uh, does that answer your question? Nutrients. So when you're planting your garden, you need to talk about what type of nutrients in there. Um, major macronutrients that everything needs in terms of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, those three NPK are what you're going to see on the back of fertilizers. Um, it's going to tell you what are the macronutrients that this particular fertilizer has. Uh, soil test, and I'll talk about that in the next slide, is a key thing because that will give you information about what is in your soil, what nutrients you need, macro and micronutrients. Another key thing is pH. Most gardens, uh, vegetable gardens, like to have pH in the 6.2 to 6.5 range, so slightly acidic. Most plants like that. Um, and so this is the kind of level that we're looking at. You'll get that in the, in the soil test that we also provide. For nutrients and fertilizers, there's differences in, in which each one does in PNK. For some, you get better uh, plant, some you get better foliage, some you get better fruit. Can you sure. Um, yeah, so basically nitrogen is going to give you green things and green and, and growth for your plant, um, which is also one reason, for example, in tomatoes, when we first plant tomatoes, we can have a little bit of nitrogen in the soil, but we don't want to continually fertilize tomatoes with nitrogen because we want the plant to stop growing tall and start putting flowers out. Um, otherwise, you're going to have wonderfully green, big green plants with no flowers on it. Um, phosphorus and potassium deal with kind of the root structure um, and, and growth, particularly in the early stages of the plants. Um, they are, uh, they're less modifiable in terms of, and, and, and in our area, a lot, of, oops, a lot of our soils in our area have um, a huge amount of phosphorus off the chart in many cases. There's really nothing you can do about it. If you're too, if you're too heavy in some of these things, there's nothing really you can do on the soil. Um, but those are things that we can, when you get a soil test back as a master gardener, we can help you interpret and give you an idea of what to do on some of them. Uh, one of the most key things, again, are really the pH level. Getting the pH level right is super important because pH is the way plants absorb these. So if your pH level is off, the plant's not gonna, not gonna absorb the, the micro and the macronutrients that it needs. Nitrogen is another key thing um, that's, that's pretty important that we can add into the soil. Um, and nitrogen is pretty transient. It means that it doesn't stay in the soil for a long time. Soil test. Over here we've got some soil test boxes. Um, and one of, the, one of the things to become a master gardener is realize how to actually put the box together. It's, it's one of the challenges that we have. Uh, it's our, part of our test. Um, but soil tests are free from uh, Mid-April through mid-November. So right now, if you wanted a soil test, there's a charge for that. Our agronomic services part of the NC Department of Agriculture does that to try to spread their load out. Um, it's wonderful that we have free soil tests as homeowners. Um, many states charge all year round. They only charge during the, their peak season because farmers are bringing their, their soil tests in right now and they're trying to give that, since they drive, help drive our economy as a state, they, we're trying to do that um, and spread their load out. But what's really cool is we get these soil tests back um, and they give you information about phosphorus, potassium, um, and a little bit on nitrogen. Although they're not directly testing nitrogen, they give you, oops, they give you recommended nitrogen results. Um, they also are giving you pH level. So in this case, um, I'm not even sure where this, what this is. This was in a vegetable garden. This is a relatively, um, high pH, so it's a little bit, um, 
it's a little bit alkali, it needs to be a little bit more acidic. You can do things like adding things like leaf mulch, pine bark, other things like that to, to, um, to lower that pH to make it more acidic. Um, as you can see in this case, the phosphorus and potassium levels are off the scale. But there's really not much you can do about it. A lot of that has to deal with the soil that's there. If you're using a lot of compost, which is great, a lot of them have um, potassium and phosphorus already in that compost, so you can't do a whole lot on that. What's um, ideal pH? Ideal pH, 6.2 to 6.5. 6.2 to 6.5 for vegetable garden. And one of the things that's it, it's great on these soil test results, depending on what value you put in for the crop type that's in there, they will come back with the recommended pH range. So, for example, if you put in a soil test, and this soil test can be done not only for vegetable gardens, but for your lawn, azaleas, perennial plants, they will come back with the recommended rains, recommended uh, phosphorus levels, potassium levels, lime, also the micronutrients that are in here. They'll have those things for that. Um, again, a little bit about different types of fertilization. We talked about the bot in the bags, there's NPK. Uh, this is a percentage. So this number is actually the percentage in that bag of nitrogen. So if you have a 100-pound bag of fertilizer, if it's a 21, 21% of that bag is nitrogen. Um, as you can tell, these numbers don't add up to 100. That is because there is a lot of filler in a lot of those fertilizers. Um, so you will, you will see that in a lot of cases. I'm ending my uh, soil. I already uh, talked about that. If your pH is too low, if it's too acidic, which we'll find a lot in our area because of a lot of the pine trees, uh, you can raise that pH, make it more alkali by adding lime. Uh, if you have high pH, it's too alkali and you want it more acidic, you can add things like pine bolts. Um, there are chemicals that you can add like element or sulfur. Just be careful. A lot of times sulfurs can burn plants, so you have to be with that carefully. Yes? Um, we typically recommend a pelletized lime and applying that before a lime is typically lime, but definitely read the label about what is in that um, because a lot of times they mix a lot of other things in there, including things like herbicides. So you do want to read what is on the label and defines what things are, are, are in the actual bag itself. Yes? Why not the powder? Um, only because lime takes, you want to have it spread out over time. Pelletized will break down over a period of time. You can use powder. Um, there is lime that comes in a powderized form. Um, but then that will not exist in the soil for a long period of time. And you want this to kind of spread out during your entire growing season. Another solution for gardening, a lot of times we have really tough soil here. Um, although I'm, I'm very thankful that we have clay versus sand. So uh, counter blessings that we have clay. Clay may not be the best. It holds a lot of moisture, but it also holds a lot of nutrients. Sand holds nothing. And so anything that you put in sand goes right through the sand. Um, one way that you can deal with, with some of that is to add more organic material into the clay that helps break those clay particles apart. And double digging is one methodology where you remove the top layer and, and put compost or other material or break up the, the soil, the subsoil that's below that and then add more composted materials on top of it. So we talked about all of our design, planning, what we're going to grow, what kind of things. Now let's actually get the planting. So, when to plant? I already talked a little bit about this, but two key bookend dates. If you're looking at summertime planting and warm season crop, April 15th, tax day, October 31st, Halloween, are two good rough days um, that you can think about warm season crops. So you don't want to plant your peppers and tomatoes before April 15th, and you should expect that you're going to get a killing frost somewhere around October 31st. Now, that varies. I do a lot of times my plants I need to get out sooner because tomatoes are hankering to get out by the early April time frame. So I'm looking at, you know, am I going to get frost the next two weeks? Is there a way I can protect my plants? Tomatoes and peppers will die if you get a, get a night below 30 degrees. So um, you have to be careful of that. But I will, you can look out. So these are just kind of benchmarks, but a good idea just to remember when you're planting. Outside of that, the April 15th through October, then you're dealing with the cool season stuff in the spring and the fall. Seed packs are a wealth of information. They have a ton of information on it regarding different types of, of, of 
of information on growing the individual plants, what is in there, when the sell by date is. Um, a lot of times I get questions, can I keep the seeds from year to year? And the answer is, it depends. Some seeds do well storage, some don't do well. Ideally, if you're storing seeds, you're putting them in a cool, dry, um, low humidity location. Um, those are, those are th the best way to kind of preserve seeds. In general, philosophy of the seeds are very small, things like lettuce seeds, they do not save very well. They don't preserve from year to year. So if I'm planting lettuce seeds, I'm not going back anything more than a sell date before 2019. Um, everything else I'm throwing out because they're probably not going to have, they may germinate, but you have a very low germination rate. So we try not to do that. Um, other seeds like tomatoes and peppers can save from year to year. They're hardier seeds, they're larger, they have a tendency to survive more and have a better germination rate. So let's start planting from seeds. Uh, no, this really isn't how this grows. <laughs> So planting from seeds, um, lots of different ways you can plant different seeds. Um, there's row uh, methods where you can create a row and plant seeds there, banding, hilling, a lot of things like squashes, um, zucchinis, cucumbers do well in a hilling. Uh, a lot of times individual drilling or holes. Uh, we recommend the soil be moist and um, the number one rule on planting from seeds is people have a tendency to plant seeds way too deep. You should never be more than one to two times the largest diameter of a seed. So think of a really small seed like a lettuce seed, you're going to basically put almost on the top of the soil. It's a very small seed, you just barely want to cover it up with soil. Other seeds, larger seeds can go down a little bit further, but err on the side of planting them shallower because a seed is uh, an embryo with a picnic basket. It has enough energy to get itself up, its stalk up, and its first set of leaves out to start the photosynthesis process. If you plant it too deep, it is not going to have the energy in that seed itself to get that up and get those leaves out, and it will die before it actually germinates. What is banding? Um, banding is a way of putting it in uh, somewhat like rows, but you can put it in, um, in, in multiple bands in there. Um, I have also have another way particularly with little kids, it's spreading it, just throwing it out. Um, that's, that's a little bit more random, um, and it does require you to uh, thin. We'll talk about thinning in just a second. So thinning is a way, if you get too many seeds, and a lot of times when you're dealing with really small seeds, you can't get them equally spaced apart, or spaced apart enough so that you're gonna have the space that they need to grow. So you need to pinch or cut out those um, preferred to as a pulling, uh, pulling plants because it avoids more root damage, less root damage. When you look at transplants, a lot of times people will ask me, well, what kind of transplants I should use? Transplants are a nice, easy way to get started quickly, um, and you can buy relatively small um, numbers of plants. So if I don't need a whole variety of tomatoes, I only need two or three tomato plants, I can buy via transplants. You want to look for ones that are healthy, that are not too tall, that haven't been out there, and are not too leggy. You want to look for ones that are not diseased, so that the in insects or, or diseases are not on the leaves, and you want to look at ones that have a, a root structure. If you can pull them slightly out uh, without getting in trouble from the, from the nursery looking at them, look at what their root structure looks like. Have they been bound in that pot? Are they completely root bound? Or have they just been relatively easily um, grown and are easy to, to plant? Uh, when I do pull them out, I will break that root structure out and apart when I plant them to get those roots away from the circular pattern they typically get when they hit a plastic edge of the pot and that gets those roots spreading out. Um, do look for pests under and in and around leaves. So if you see um, little clusters of eggs on a transplant or on, a, on a, uh, a small seedling or a transplant, I would typically avoid those. Um, transplanting, you want to put them in the soil when the soil is moist. Um, if you're using peat and fiber pots, you can plant them directly in the soil, but you want them below the soil length. Um, you do want to harden your plants. So one of the things that we try to teach people is also make sure that you, you get to harden your plants. Give them a chance to get outside. My plants that are, have been inside, growing inside since December, um, I bring them out for a couple hours every day, let them get outside, enjoy the sunlight and a little bit of the rain, enjoy the wind that's out there because they're going from a nice pristine environment inside with grow lights to something outside. Give them a chance, and whether that's summertime crops or wintertime crops. 
Planting tomatoes are a little different. Tomatoes have, a, have this thing called adventitious roots that are roots, and you may have seen these little lumps along the, the sides of the tomato plants. Um, those are root structures, since so tomato is a vine, uh, it, can, it can be buried in the ground, and that will make that tomato plant stronger. So if you get a tall, leggy tomato plant, Remove all but the top three sets of leaves. Plant it either straight in the, in the ground, if you can dig a hole deep enough, or you can even plant it horizontally and slightly curve the top up. That'll get that tomato plant much stronger um, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a better plant growing. Disease and pest control. Um, I'm gonna talk about a couple of the major ones, but basically um, there's some things that you can do by making, keeping your plant stronger and healthier, you'll have less disease and pest control problems. We practice and promote a, a practice called integrated pest management. Integrated pest management is the idea of I will monitor my plants and set thresholds for what damage I'm willing to accept. So I'm willing to eat a piece of kale that has some holes in it. It doesn't have to be a pristine plant. I'm willing to eat a tomato that maybe has some blemishes on it. But that's because I'm a organic or mostly organic gardener and I, I accept the, those types of damage. At some point, I, as I'm monitoring my plants, I determine, hey, there's too much damage. I'm going to lose my entire plant. I'm going to lose my tomatoes. I'm going to have no peppers. And then I have to do something about it. Sometimes it's physical. Sometimes it's chemical. Those things then I monitor the result after I apply that control. And I continue in this whole cycle of integrated pest management. I keep in mind what the pests are and what their cycle is and how I can control those easily. That's all part of the IPM. We have more information about IPM as you need, might need it. So let's go through some of the top four pests here in Central North Carolina. Tomato hornworms, one of the first ones. Also tobacco, called tobacco worms. Um, this, really easy to tell. If you have a tomato plant that looks like someone has just stripped all the leaves off of that tomato plant, you've got a tomato hornworm. It's there somewhere. Uh, then you can do the where, where's Waldo, try to find a tomato, uh, tomato hornworm. Um, this one's really cool. This is a great example of Parasitic wasp that actually has laid its eggs inside the hornworm. The eggs have actually come out through the hornworm. They're outside, they're maturing. Um, they are gonna turn into more parasitic wasps. And this is nature's way of controlling the hornworm versus man's way of controlling it through a chemical way. Um, this is great. This guy, this tomato hornworm is already dead. He's or, or already close to being dead because he's already been basically eaten from the inside out. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> but, but I love it when nature takes control, right? You know, man has not touched this. The parasite, parasitic wasp has taken control of this and controls that population. So would you not pick that one off? So I would do is, if he's probably not eating a whole lot, so you could leave him there, or I might just take him or take that little piece and move it to some other part of the garden. But I would definitely let these parasitic wasps yeah. mature. Because you want them to grow and to send more, make more wasps and, and to do the things that they're doing. This, on the other hand, squash vine borer is nature's way of not controlling things. Um, squash vine borer, right now, we have no control for. Um, they are, it's a moth that flies actually during the daytime, lays its eggs in the soil. Those eggs come up through the root structure and through the vine and will beautiful squash plant one day, the next day it's completely collapsed. Um, at this point, there's nothing we can do about it. There are some IPM methods that you can try, which is one, rotate crops. So don't plant your um, squashes and zucchinis in one location. Um, plant collars, we've not seen that very successful because the, the actual larva is in the soil and it can bypass that collar. Um, we have seen some success with row covers. So when you plant your zucchini, if you plant them in succession, you can put a row cover over them. Gives the, chance, the plant a chance to grow um, you do have to remove that row cover once the flowers start um, producing because otherwise it won't get pollinated and you won't have uh, squashes. Um, but we've seen that give the squash more of a, of, a, of a chance to produce more fruit before the squash vine borer takes it out. You still will eventually lose, the squash vine borer will find it. Um, and it's become such a big problem down east. Um, there's, there's a lot of places that are not growing squashes anymore. So this idea of you get too many squashes and give them to your neighbors is um, changing. Other pests, squash bugs, um, things you can do is buy resistant varieties and remove debris. Um, eggs are really easy to detect on the underside of leaves, um, usually like a red mass of little tiny eggs that are out there, so they're easy to do and control. Um, they don't typically do a tremendous amount. They will damage some of the fruit, um, so those are things to watch. 
Um, aphids um, are also a common plant problem in our area. Rarely, rarely kills the plant, um, but you can contr control that by covering or using insecticidal soap or neem oil to provide uh, a, a way of controlling some of those aphids. Um, nature also has a way of controlling aphids with ladybird beetles. They're, they love aphids. Diseases, blossom end rot, um, talk a little bit about that in just a little bit minute. Um, soil pH and calcium are really critical. Tomato blights, early late blights um, are going to be a fact of life here in North Carolina. Um, it says keep water off the leaves, but anybody who's been here through at least one summer realizes we're pretty much wet all summer long, um, except for a few dry periods of time. Um, and, and inconsistent water also causes a lot of problems, particularly with blights. Um, so the reality is, is you're going to have problems with blight with, if you're growing tomatoes at some point. You may get a few years if you're lucky in a brand new garden. You need to not compost those plants. So if you have infected plants, any plants, do not compost them. That will keep that, um, keep that disease away from your compost. Um, you do want to rotate crops for, to, for dealing with blights. Um, uh, Fusarium or verticulum wilt. You'll see at the end of varieties like Roma VF, VFN, those are plants that are resistant and varieties that are resistant to these wilts. Um, crop rotation, another way, removing the lower sets of leaves. A lot of these are soil-borne diseases that if you can remove the lower sets of leaves, rain that's hitting the soil and splashing it up is not gonna, it's gonna resist that disease. Powdery, downy, mildew, also a big issue with us on a lot of crops like um, squashes, cucumbers, they have a big impact on it. You can preventatively deal with fungicides, uh, organic ones like oils and sulfurs. Um, keep them separated and, and in moisture. Try to keep them dry, but again, during the summertime, you have more of a problem. So here's one of our first quizzes. Uh, good bugs or bad bugs? Um, on the left-hand side, good bug or bad bug? All right, anybody know what it is? This one? Yes, Mexican bean beetle or potato beetle. Um, right hand side, ladybug. Um, another key is what plant is it on, right? Even if they look almost the same and you can't tell how many spots, this one's on a bean plant, this is on a tomato. You're not gonna typically see Mexican bean beetles on tomato plants, and conversely, this ladybug is looking for aphids on that tomato plant, so um, kind of things to look at. These are kind of common bugs that you're gonna find in our area. Um, this is an example of some bean beetle damage. Again, a bean beetle may not kill the plant. It could damage it, and it's certainly going to cause a problem in terms of uh, being able to uh, produce as much as it might want to do. You're going to weaken the plant. But I'm willing to take some bean plants with some damage if I'm not having to spray a whole lot of things. Other things damaged, speaking about spraying, here's an example on the left-hand side, a healthy tomato plant, nice and good. This is a real-world example of a tomato plant that was in the food bank garden. Um, the landscaping folks sprayed some Roundup on one of the islands next to us, and that spray over during that day caused serious damage both physically to the plant and to all of the flowering tomatoes that were on that. So be, be aware, um, and it's not just Roundup, it's any type of, you're playing spraying 2,4-D on your lawn for broadleaf herb, or for broadleaf um, uh, weeds, that spray can spray over into your vegetable gardens. And there's a lot of plants, particularly tomatoes, that are super sensitive to that. Um, there's also herbicides if you're using um, composts or, uh, we've seen it in some composts recently where they've been contaminated uh, with herbicides. Um, straw and hay, depending on where they're being grown, could also have herbicide damage in it. So if you're spraying hay as a mulch, putting mulch out there with, with hay, uh, be aware of where your source is and what they're doing in there. Um, blossom end rot is another really big problem in our area. Again, we talked a little bit about that. Calcium deficiency as well as uh, pH is a re really key thing. And certain varieties. So this zebra tomato and some of the heirloom tomatoes are more susceptible to blossom end rot and calcium uptake. Um, you can fix that by adding lime. Another uh, another magical thing is if you make hard-boiled eggs for egg salad or something, that water, let it cool, full of calcium, place that at the base of your soil for your plants. Cabbage worms, um, kind of another thing. Can anybody see the couple of the things that are, are ways of determining a cabbage worm? That's this, we'll have that this time of year, particularly this week. 
as it gets warm again, cold, cold weather cabbage worms don't come out and it starts getting warm. They're going to start popping out. Um, so if you didn't see them, three telltale signs. One, you can see the little black dots that look like little tiny peppercorns that are on there. That's the scat from the uh, morphesis from the cabbage worm. The worm itself, as well as eating around the edge of the damage of that. And this is, these are going to show up on basically all my cabbages, broccolis, uh, anything associated with that, uh, that cabbage family. Flea beetles, another example. Um, little tiny bug that's in there that'll put little small holes in it. Probably won't kill the plant, but if it becomes a point where that plant is coming to do damage, then my whole IPM process is going to say I have to do something to control that. Okay, so here's the next quiz. <clears throat> We're getting towards the end of the presentation, and I'm already over time. Sorry about that, Chris. Um, what's wrong with this picture? So it's, it's not coming from the same time. Right, so you're not going to have cabbages along with green beans, along with radishes and celery. Um, this is from more like a farmer's market or a grocery store. So know what to grow is really important. When to harvest, um, what to look for. So look for maturity in terms of your plants. Understand that jalapeno peppers do not have to be green. Technically, they would be ripened if they go red or another color. There are purple ones and yellow ones and the same thing with other peppers. But know what to grow, share your harvest if you have extra, um, store if your harvest, eat if you can, fresh, harvest it, and store it if you can. <coughs> um, more things about freezing and canning, we have information about NC State. Canning process. So, started out with why do we garden? A lot of reasons why we garden is because we are doing it as friends and family. We're trying to teach the next generations. A lot of it is so that we can donate and give back to our community. These are food bank volunteers. Additional information, uh, Master Gardeners have a Facebook page and web page. We've got a lot of information about that. We also have a series of classes that we do with the library that's actually starting today called Ready, Garden, Grow. Instead of it being only an hour long class about vegetable gardening, it's a two and a half hour long class. It goes through a lot of this and in more details. Um, so I welcome you to go ahead and take a look at it, pick up a flyer about Ready, Garden, Grow. And if you have any additional questions, contact information there. Um, any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, so, question on crop rotation and like an urban backyard. Sure. How would you, I'm confused on rotate. I get rotating crops. Right. Like growing up in the farm, big scale. Right. But how would you mix that with companion farming and a companion gardening and a raised bed that it's no problem for me to add supplements to it the next year? Sure. You know, I, I mean, also understanding like I get, I got still got to move that tomato, but you know, is it as excessive in the tomato to go back to that bed two years later? Right. And so forth. So, so the question is on rotating in small spaces and small urban gardens. Um, with companion. With, along with companion gardening, um, and I'll make a comment on com companion gardening in just a minute. So absolutely can rotate things on a short uh, and a small space, but that means I'm just going to be able to move it in a small area. So I'll maybe it move from one side of the bed one year to the other side of the bed to the middle of the bed. That way, at least it's not the same physical plant in the same soil all the time. Right? And so from a soil nutrient perspective, that part of the bed, that side of the bed, and this side of the bed are going to be, it's going to be spread out. Um, companion planting is an interesting question. Um, that there isn't a lot of scientific Rich, research. Before we get into oh. it, we're, we're trying to stay on okay, the all right, here. All right, so Rich has a ton of information and he could, you know, extend. Go on, go on forever. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, but Rich is going to be here, so we're going we're gonna to have a... 10 minute, 15 minute break? We'll be back at 11.15. 11.15. Yeah, so he'll, he's happy to talk with that. Uh, we, we, be able to I'll, I'll, be, I'll be here all day. I'll be here so, all day. And, and I can't emphasize enough how much great extent, uh, information extension has. Uh, Rich is great, but he's just one piece of really fantastic uh, 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 group of individuals with the Master Gardener who love to share their information and have a lot of it. Thank you all. Right. Thank you very much.